योग पथ अति जटिल अति कठिन अति गहन पर जाना तो है हमको अंत तक जगी है दिल में दृढ़ लगन दृढ़ लगन दृढ़ लगन योग पथ अति जटिल अति कठिन अति गहन पर जाना तो है हमको अंत तक जगी है दिल में दृढ़ लगन दृढ़ लगन दृढ़ लगन चाहे चाहे घोर अंधेरा चाहे चाहे कितने तूफान चाहे चाहे घोर अंधेरा चाहे चाहे कितने तूफान निर्भीक हो के हम चलेंगे निर्भीक हो के हम चलेंगे जननी ले चले जहाँ पे हम चलेंगे धैर्य है संकल्प है धैर्य है संकल्प है धैर्य है संकल्प है जननी बिना ना विकल्प है जननी बिना ना विकल्प है हम दिव्य तेज से जुड़ेंगे तेज से जुड़ेंगे क्योंकि अपनी शक्ति अल्प है हम दिव्य तेज से जुड़ेंगे तेज से जुड़ेंगे क्योंकि अपनी शक्ति अल्प है योग पथ अति जटिल अति कठिन अति गहन पर जाना तो है हमको अंत तक जगी है दिल में दृढ़ लगन दृढ़ लगन दृढ़ लगन योग पथ अति जटिल अति कठिन अति गहन पर जाना तो है हमको अंत तक जगी है दिल में दृढ़ लगन 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 Namaste, my dear brothers and sisters. The love and blessings of the Mother and Sri Aurobindo to all of you from Sri Aurobindo Ashram, Delhi branch. This bhajan, Yoga Path Ati Jatil Ati Kathin, uh, talks about uh, the nature of yoga, all yogas, including the integral yoga. That uh, the path of yoga is uh, complicated, complex, and difficult. There's a common misconception that uh, Integral yoga at least should be easy because uh, there's nothing specific that you have to do. You can continue living in the world, continue doing the type of work that you are doing and uh, therefore it should be easy. But uh, no yoga is easy, including integral yoga. And there are enough complications and complexities in each one of them. Because when you are living in the real world, then it also means more of... Uh, Oh, uh, distractions, temptations, uh, responsibilities, obligations, conflicts, and uh, therefore uh, the path really does not become any easier. But at the same time, what helps is uh, two things which were mentioned here very clearly. One is uh, the uh, determination, the intense aspiration which gives that determination. And uh, Secondly, connecting oneself to a higher force, realizing that uh, my effort is limited and uh, has limitations and it will never by itself be enough. Uh, it is essential, but uh, at the same time, it will not be enough. It is necessary, but totally insufficient and therefore connecting to a higher power. And uh, that higher power is the divine but then since it's difficult for us to connect to a nameless, faceless divine, we try to choose a form of the divine which we can relate to and that is the face of the guru. And uh, uh, the singer here, Vithu, was uh, uh, relating this to the mother that uh, we, we shall seek refuge in the mother and uh, that is the only alternative uh, I have. And uh, once I'm connected to that, I know in spite of my limitations, one day I'll get there. Now, today's subject is uh, an introduction to immunology. The word introduction has been put deliberately, although even otherwise I'm fond of uh, introductions, uh, because uh, this is such a vast and complex subject that uh, 
one can give only an introduction, not only because time is limited, because even my knowledge is limited. Uh, this is such a vast subject that I may tell you about half of what I know, but uh, what I know is uh, not even 1% of what a top immunologist would know. And uh, what the top immunologist knows may be only a small fraction of everything that is known in the field of immunology. And everything that is known in the field of immunology is in itself only a small fraction of everything that can be known or what still remains to be known. And uh, therefore, uh, all I can do is uh, give you a mere simple introduction to the field of immunology. And this is something in which we all got interested, particularly during the corona pandemic, because uh, the antibodies and the vaccines and the so on were being talked about so much uh, in the media that uh, we all got curious to know a little more about this complex subject. And although the pandemic is now over, it has been declared to be over officially, uh, we still can benefit a lot because the pandemic might be over, but uh, life on earth continues to be as it has always been. Uh, life on earth is uh, in fact part of uh, a rather complex, delicately balanced ecosystem. And we are a part of it. And it is based on a give and take. And uh, the overall economy of this give and take is rather harsh. As you know, in a little slightly different context, as Shirobindo says somewhere, that uh, give and take, uh, for which we can use the word sacrifice, uh, is uh, something that is fundamental to the world or the fundamental to the play of nature in general. And if we refuse to give, if we only want to take, the sacrifice will be extracted by force. We'll be forced to give. So it is in this harsh economy that we live. One uh, form of life thrives on another form of life. There is a coexistence. It is by and large peaceful, but all the same. Uh, what is important is that uh, we should have some defense mechanisms which can help us at least to a limited extent in uh, surviving in an environment in which other forms of life are also wanting to live like us, and some of them uh, may end up living at our expense. So this is a, a sort of a by way of introduction, but all the same, uh, life on Earth has been around for uh, billions of years, human beings also for uh, a very long time, and uh, the enemies that human beings have to dread are not really the snakes and the tigers, but tiny, organisms which we can't even see. And uh, the fact is that in spite of these organisms, we have survived and they have also survived. Not only they have survived, as we saw, new ones keep emerging like the coronavirus did recently. Uh, so in this uh, sort of system, which is based on coexistence, uh, the germs have survived, <laughs> we have survived, and uh, the tiny germs, in spite of their microscopic size, are in no way less likely to survive than us. In fact, they might continue to be there even after human beings have become extinct. <clears throat> so this little introduction, let's go to the PowerPoint. Can you see the? Yes. Slide. So this is a mere introduction to this vast subject of immunology. Before I go further, uh, the 11 blessings of the mother and Shiorabindu to all of you. 
once again from Shirobindo Ashram, Delhi branch. Uh, we are like a hotel. Uh, why I'm saying so is because uh, the number of human cells in the body is about 30 trillion. The number of uh, bacterial cells, about 38 trillion. Both these estimates have been changing with time. Uh, different estimates vary a lot one from the other. But one thing that is common to all the estimates of this type is that the number of bacterial cells is more than the number of human cells. And I put bacterial in quotes because uh, strictly speaking, these are not all bacteria. Some of them may be fungi and viruses and so on. But the fact is that these tiny germs, they are much more in number than the human cells. So in fact, we are more germs than human and we host all of them. And so we are serving as a sort of a hotel for this vast population of these uh, tiny microscopic organisms. However, not all these guests are welcome. You know, in India, we say, Atithi Devo Bhava. All guests are to be treated like God and a guest is like a God. But the fact is that in, the, uh, in this situation, at least, uh, many of these uh, guests, so-called guests who are living in this hotel that our body is, are not really guests, but infiltrators. They can do harm to us. And uh, uh, therefore, what is important is that uh, we try and uh, prevent these infiltrators from entering. And if they have entered, we should have a way of defending ourselves before they can do us much harm. And in this uh, conflict between the guests uh, who are always welcome, and in fact, by and large, much of this bacterial population or population of microorganisms is helpful to us. They help us in many ways. And uh, in fact, this idea of uh, having a microbiome, particularly you know, these uh, bacteria reside on the skin and in the gastrointestinal tract. And uh, this is what is now called the microbiome. Uh, and uh, the type of uh, microbiome that we have seems to be an important determinant of uh, health which means that these guests are in fact contributing to our health in many ways. And therefore this ancient uh, idea in Ayurveda that uh, as is our gut, that is the gastrointestinal tract, the digestive system, so is our health, has more than a grain of truth about it. But anyway, that we shall have an occasion to talk in greater detail after a few days. Uh, but uh, the important thing is that uh, these welcome guests who are by and large the much larger in number than the infiltrators, also help us in taking care of the infiltrators. And uh, they do that by sometimes uh, actually attacking the infiltrators, but more often by competing with them for nutrients which are available in the gastrointestinal tract. And therefore, one way of uh, increasing the number of desirable bacteria in the gut uh, and uh, preventing the infiltrators is to increase the number of these desirable ones so that they'll provide good competition for the limited amount of food that is available in the gastrointestinal tract. And therefore, suppose a person has taken antibiotics and has killed a vast population of germs in the gastrointestinal tract, and the person gets a diarrhea, but then to uh, take care of this diarrhea, what uh, we do is to give the person uh, germs which are healthy through the mouth, like selectobacilli sometimes as such in a capsule or in the form of something from curd. I was hesitating to talk a little bit about curd, although uh, by and large, most people think that it will be very good to take curd all the time and particularly in a situation where the gastrointestinal tract is upset and we want to replace the uh, unhealthy germs. We want to increase the population of the healthy germs and the curd will be a good way to do it. Yes, the curd does have a large population of germs which are good for us, but all the same, in Ayurveda, it is discouraged. Curd is discouraged because it can block various channels. Uh, and what is favored is uh, chach, that is buttermilk, which means churn it, remove the butter from it, and then what is left behind is the chach that also has the same type of germs, and this is what would be favored in Ayurveda. Uh, but all the same, the principle remains that uh, uh, if due to any reason, taking antibiotics or due to any other reason, the gut flora have been disturbed and we have we are left with only a small population of the friendly germs uh, which, who can be called our 
welcome guests and that leaves an opportunity for the infiltrators to come in making use of this opportunity that there is food available but we have very little competition so to prevent that we make concerted efforts to increase the number of these desirable germs no matter how we do it by taking a capsule containing lactobacilli or whether we do it with buttermilk in fact this is something which uh, Metznikov, you know, one of the uh, pioneers in this field, uh, had realized, uh, and uh, under the impression that these germs will do him good, he started taking very large amounts of uh, buttermilk every day. In fact, heroic amounts, and he did survive very long. Whether it was because of the buttermilk or uh, irrespective of it, that is difficult to say. But all the same, he did. Metznikov did end up living a long life. Now, the defense mechanisms, before we go into what is the so-called proper immune mechanisms, let's look at it, the variety of defense mechanisms that we have. Uh, the first is uh, we have a fence all around us in the form of the skin. So the skin itself is protective, but then uh, every fence also has to have a few doors for entry. And we also have at least these three listed here, the mouth, the nose, and the eyes. Uh, they are all required and it is here that the skin is not there. Not only that, through the mouth and the nose, we put in a, deliberately a lot of material from outside. Through the mouth food and through the nose, we let outside air enter us. And uh, all these can be sources of a variety of germs, some of which may not be good for us. And therefore, uh, if the skin is not there, within these regions, we have a Again, a sort of a fence, uh, which will not let them go much further. So you find that uh, in the mouth, the nose, and the eyes, there are fluids, and these fluids have antibacterial substances, in some cases also antibodies, which uh, are locally active. And uh, uh, therefore, uh, although uh, the fence is not very visible, there is a defense mechanism in all these. And that is why, you know, oral surgery, after oral surgery, we can't uh, have any bandaging, antiseptic bandage, etc. But uh, infections after oral surgery, like say tonsillectomy, are extremely rare. That is because the mouth has inbuilt uh, mechanisms for uh, taking care of the germs locally. And in the same way, the nose, nose also has secretions which uh, uh, are antibacterial in nature. And in fact, uh, uh, one of the first sort of antibacterial substances, penicillin, was discovered accidentally when it was found that the investigator had a common cold and uh, the nasal secretions ripped into the uh, plate which had uh, bacterial culture, you know, bacteria growing under artificial conditions in the laboratory in a plate. The nasal secretions dripped into it and he found that around the place where this nasal secretion had dripped, there was a clearing, which means there was no, there, no germs could grow there. And then, you know, uh, a, a person who has a prepared mind, as Pasteur said, you know, uh, he has a prepared mind. He doesn't feel that, well, something has gone wrong. The bacteria are not growing. But uh, he would think that, what is it that it's not, make the, uh, it's not making them grow? If it is something from the nose, then can we find uh, something uh, which is similar to what is coming from the nose, which would help in uh, uh, fighting infections. So in the same way in the eyes, the tears also have a similar mechanism. And in the stomach, we have acid. Most germs can't survive acid. So we have a sort of a fence available, even at places where the skin is broken. And uh, as far as the stomach, we have a fence. But then no fence can be completely invincible. There will be always infiltrators who can jump the fence. So then, uh, we have to go to the next level and uh, then we have to have no, uh, beyond the fence some police and army and that is what the immune, immune system can be looked at and all the cells that participate in the immune mechanisms are white blood cells. So you know when we are told in school uh, in the primary school that uh, uh, the blood has two types of cells red cells and white cells and the white cells are our soldiers they defend us against disease in a sense, this statement is true. And uh, the white blood cells, like the other blood cells, are born in the bone marrow. Now, there are two types of immunity. 
One is the innate immunity. Innate immunity is something that we are born with. We, are, we have this, these mechanisms right at birth. It is non-specific in nature, which means it doesn't work against uh, just a few selected germs. It uh, works against a variety of germs as well as some other harmful chemicals, which may not be germs. It is non-specific in nature. And it does not require prior exposure, which means that one doesn't have to be exposed to the same germ earlier uh, for it to, to develop. It is there right at birth. And therefore, naturally, it does not require a prior exposure to the germ. And it doesn't have any memory, which means that once a person has tackled some germ using the innate immune mechanisms, it's not that the next time the innate immune mechanisms would remember and therefore be able to deal with it more efficiently. Now, these are some of the characteristics of the innate immune system. Uh, and uh, let's see what is the major mechanism that the innate immune system uh, system uses. The major mechanism is that of phagocytosis. Phago means to eat, cyto is cell. So it is eating by a cell. And this eating is very similar to the way a single celled organism like an amoeba eats. Uh, now here this uh, sort of shown in a diagrammatic fashion and the series of steps through which this happens. Suppose uh, there is a germ and now this germ is to be treated as food by this phagocyte in the innate immune system. They are everywhere, you know, like the uh, guards. You have a guard at every gate in every colony. So it is like, so they are present everywhere. These phagocytes, which are a part of the innate immune system are all over the body everywhere. And uh, therefore, uh, this will be the first sort of uh, contact of the germ if it has escaped the fence. If it has escaped the fence, then the next at the next level, he'll meet these guards, uh, which are everywhere all over the body. And what do these guards do? They uh, have cells which can eat this, eat at least a certain variety of germs. And uh, when this phagocyte finds that there's a germ coming along, which can be treated as food, what it does, it changes its shape. It throws its arms around uh, this, and uh, the, uh, the way it throws the arms looks as if it loves the germ. It's a hug. And uh, in a way, uh, it is true. Uh, why I'm saying that is because I'm reminded of uh, uh, what uh, George Bernard Shaw said in one of his plays, the tiger loves you. No love is more sincere than the love for food. So the phagocyte, for the phagocyte, this germ is food and no love is more sincere than the love for food. And therefore it expresses this love by extending the arms as if it is going to hug it. But then it hugs it so tight that now the germ is inside, as you can see in picture number three. So the germ has been internalized. And then within the phagocyte, you know, this red colored circle is a lysosome. Lysosome has digestive enzymes. Now, the two start moving close to, closer to each other. This uh, bubble that has the germ in it and this small red bubble which has digestive enzymes in it. And these two bubbles fuse in the phagocyte. And once they have fused, this, the digestive enzymes are released from this red bubble and uh, the germ gets digested the way we digest food in our intestinal tract. So this is how the germ is taken care of by the cells of the innate immune system. However, not all germs can be handled this way. There are some which are beyond the capacity of these phagocytes, which are ubiquitous, present all over the body, and the first type of cells that any germ meets, provided it has been able to jump the fence. So innate immunity is present all over the body, and the cells that participate in it are the monocytes. And then the other day, we, when we were talking about blood, we saw that there are uh, uh, two types of blood cells, those which have granules in their cytoplasm and which, those which don't have. Those which don't have granules are the monocytes and the lymphocytes. And the monocytes are those which do not have granules and have a kidney-shaped nucleus. Now, these monocytes in the blood keep migrating periodically into the tissues and then their name changes 
they are called macrophages. Macro is large. Phage refers to their eating character. Large cells that eat. And they act like guards. As uh, you know, we saw that they are uh, acting like the guards, uh, getting hold of the germ. And if they are able to take care of that germ completely, they just kill it by digesting it. So they use a rather primitive method, which may be compared to lynching. But then if they can't lynch, if the germ is too ferocious to be lynched in this fashion, then at least they try to get hold of the germ and pass it on to a less primitive, well-trained force like the police or the army. Less primitive, but primitive all the same, because even the soldiers uh, or the police to whom the, these guards hand over this uh, culprit is not new. It is present in all animals, uh, including human beings. And uh, therefore, it's not uh, very primitive, but it's less primitive because this mechanism by which the phagocytes eat, this mechanism is present also in single-celled animals like amoeba. The amoeba doesn't have any uh, thing beyond this to defend itself. The amoeba also uses something similar to cut, get food as well as to move away from uh, something which may harm it. So this is a, a very primitive mechanism, uh, lynching by which the amoeba eats, these cells also eat. And in the process of eating this germ, they defend us. But if the germ can't be lynched, they hand it over to a less primitive, well-trained force. And uh, that force is what we uh, may call broadly the specific acquired immunity. So innate immunity is something which we are born with. Specific acquired immunity we are not born with. It is acquired after birth. And it is specific in nature, which means that it comes up with a specific response for each different germ. And it requires prior exposure. Once the person has been exposed to it and dealt with a certain infection, then the person is better equipped to deal with it the next time. So the mechanism has a memory. And therefore, it is only after the exposure that uh, the defense mechanism comes into play. And uh, once it has happened, the next time it is much easier because this mechanism has a memory. One might say that if one is not born with specific acquired immunity, one has to acquire it. A newborn baby has still not been exposed to any type of germ. Then how does the newborn defend itself? Uh, in newborn babies, it takes about one and a half year for specific acquired immunity to develop properly. The apparatus itself takes time. And even after that, it will require exposure to different germs to be able to develop immunity to the large variety of these germs that we have. So that's why one finds that uh, uh, a child quite often keeps having fever. But then before that, you might ask that, well, how does it survive the first one and a half year before this apparatus has been properly put into place? During that one and a half year, what helps in the beginning for the first few months at least is uh, the antibodies that were passed on by the mother through her blood to the baby. Secondly, the baby gets a good dose of these uh, antibodies or ready-made sort of, you know, uh, molecules which can tackle infections uh, without the apparatus. With the type of apparatus which produces these antibodies, that is not, not well developed in the baby, but it can acquire this passive immunity by the end products of this uh, immune mechanism, that is the antibodies, by getting them from the mother's blood while it is still in the mother's womb and getting it from the mother's milk after it is born. And that is why one reason at least, so that is one reason besides many other reasons why breastfeeding is better than giving any other type of milk. Because through the breast milk, particularly in the first few days, that colostrum, which is a little different from the milk that comes later on, that is a good source of these uh, antibodies and uh, helps the baby develop immunity. So that is how it survives the first one to one and a half year. And that is why uh, if a child has crossed the first year of life, then it is likely to live a full lifespan. So during the first year, in spite of this help that comes from its mother, it remains a little vulnerable. And at the same time, 
After that, again, it has to be exposed to a variety of germs to be able to acquire immunity to them one by one. And therefore, a child keeps falling sick. There are hardly any child who doesn't get fever a few times in a, almost every year. Uh, but after the child is about 15 years old, it has been exposed to just about every germ. And these days, for some of them, the child has been vaccinated. And the result is that uh, after the age of about 15, the child uh, rarely falls ill and uh, never needs leave from school or college and keep going throughout the year without any illness. So then illness is more or less a forgotten story. Uh, so that is specific acquired immunity. Uh, we are not born with it. We acquire it by getting exposed to the germ. And it is specific for each germ. And uh, it has a memory so that the response to the second uh, infection, that is the second time a person gets the same infection, is much better than the first time. Now here, uh, we find that uh, there is uh, this uh, phagocyte and it has been exposed to a germ. Now this is a type of germ which it can't handle on its own. It will pass it on to the army or the police. It cannot uh, eat it up, but at least it can internalize it. And uh, what we find is that this germ has on its surface a variety of proteins and some of these proteins are those which are antigenic in nature. Antigen means, genuine also means give. Antigen means the protein which will give something which will be against it. So the protein itself has the quality of producing something which will neutralize this protein, which will be against this protein, which will have something which will be related to this protein. And it will be something which this germ uh, will find harmful something which will make the life of this germ miserable or maybe even kill it. So that is, you know, I drawn it in the form of a spike because during the coronavirus pandemic, it was often said that uh, the coronavirus has an antigen which resides in the spike protein on the surface of the virus. So the spiky red thing is that protein, which is the antigen. And uh, the phagocyte can't kill the germ but it has internalized it. As you can see, now the germ is inside and this spike protein, this antigenic protein is on the surface of this. And now it will uh, hand it over to the less primitive, better trained force, the police or the army. And now, therefore, this phagocyte is given a different name. We call it the antigen presenting cell, APC. Because it's presenting the antigen, to the better trained force, well-trained force, which can now take care of it. And how does it hand it over? Uh, it hands it over with the help of some helper cells, which we shall see soon, T helper cells. They help it, sort of handhold it and take it to the right place. So for that also it gets help. But then how do these T helper cells come to know that uh, uh, help is required by this antigen presenting cell? It seems that there are some chemicals which it produces, which can be called a distress call, an SOS message. Uh, so the antigen presenting cell sends this distress call uh, and the T helper cells come along. And how do the T helper cells know which soldier or policeman to hand it over to? Because of the protein on the surface of the antigen presenting cell. Now, what is this? Uh, therefore, we can say that this uh, uh, protein on the surface, this spike in this case, is sort of the ID, the identity card of the germ. So the germ's ID is on the surface so that using this ID as a guide, the T helper cell can take the the force or the army, depending upon the situation, which is a well-trained force. Where does it get its training? Now, let's see where this force is trained. What are the schools and colleges where it undergoes training? 
all blood cells, including the white blood cells, are produced in the bone marrow. We start with this germ, the pluripotent cell. Pluripotent because it has plural potency, multiple potency, which means it is still an uncommitted cell. It can form a variety of blood cells, red cells or white cells, and among white cells, any type of cell. So it is still a, an uncommitted cell. It has a vast potential. Something like you know a child uh, who uh, has So that now these differentiated cells are committed to form either a red cell or a white cell. And among white cells, they, they are committed to form uh, one type of cell or the other. And uh, some of these cells are found to be best suited for forming lymphocytes, it seems. And now those cells are committed to forming lymphocytes. So they've got differentiated into a lymphocyte. And uh, during this period, whatever training it has to get to become a lymphocyte, it is getting here. So it's like homeschooling. But uh, then for further training, it has to go to college. So it, after undergoing homeschooling and schooling in a neighborhood school, now it has to be passed on to a college for further education. Now, some of these go to a neighborhood college, which means the college also is within the bone marrow. So B, you can say for bone marrow, because they went to a school which was within the bone marrow, a local school, a neighborhood school. So all their education was within the bone marrow and then they are released to go and function wherever they are required. However, some lymphocytes don't go to the neighbor school, neighborhood college, they go to a distant college and that distant college is the thymus. Thymus is a small little organ in the neck uh, hidden by the thyroid gland, but uh, functionally not, nothing much to do with the thyroid gland. Uh, so this little organ, the thymus, is the college for these lymphocytes. And the thymus is a rather harsh, demanding, exacting college. And uh, it leads to the formation of not just uh, one type of cells like the B cells here. It forms a variety of T cells, T for thymus. It forms a variety of T cells. Not only it produces a variety of T cells, T lymphocytes, which have different functions, it also does one more thing. Some college school students can be very rowdy. So what the thymus does is it eliminates them. Now, what do we mean by a rowdy lymphocyte? These rowdy lymphocytes are those which if allowed to develop into mature and well-trained uh, lymphocytes, well-trained T cells, they would start acting against some part of the body itself. So they would start acting against some part of the body and start damaging some parts within the body. And when something goes wrong with this mechanism of eliminating these cells, one gets what are called autoimmune diseases. Because that's what happens in autoimmune diseases. We develop antibodies to some part of our own body. And therefore, a healthy immune system really depends upon distinction between what is called self and non-self. Distinguishing cells which belong to the body, belong to, the, belong to us, and distinguishing them from those that do not belong to us, distinguishing self from non-self. So those uh, lymphocytes, which would eventually form, uh, which would eventually form the type of lymphocytes which may damage some parts of our own body, these are the rowdy college students, and uh, the thymus goes for the radical solution, just kills them. So they are not uh, allowed to study any further they die within the thymus. But then those which can function, they are they become super specialists. So a rigorous training to become super specialists. And uh, one may simplify the picture by saying that there are broadly speaking three types of T lymphocytes. The T helper cells, which help, as we saw, one of the things they do is to help the antigen presenting cell go to the right soldier. And uh, cytotoxic cells, which produce a variety of cytokines, 
uh, and the TK, the killer cells, which can kill. So cytokines are chemicals that are released, killer cells directly kill. We'll talk a little bit more about these a little later, but uh, so this is the way the lymphocytes get educated to form, broadly speaking, two types of cells, B type of lymphocytes and T type of lymphocytes. Now, once they have gone through this education, where do they go and settle? They go and settle in the lymph nodes, in the gastrointestinal tract, the respiratory tract, in the spleen. So once the soldiers are trained, they go and settle in the barracks. So these can be considered sort of the barracks in which they settle. Uh, lymph nodes, why lymph nodes? Because every organ has near it a set of lymph nodes. The fluid from these organs drains into the lymph nodes and therefore, if there are germs, they can pass through these uh, channels which will go to the regional lymph node, that is the lymph node that is near that organ and can be eliminated there. So they are sort of these sentinels for each organ in the body, uh, each part of the body and therefore we find that after an infection, Sometimes these lymph nodes may be enlarged and swollen and red, but then they are, that happens because they are doing their job. And uh, like say there's a foot infection, there might be lymph nodes which are in the groin, in the upper part of the thigh, which are uh, swollen and painful for a few days. But then that is because the infection from the leg traveled through the lymphatics, the channels to these lymph nodes, and these lymph nodes are present all over the body and can take care of the infections from different parts. So that is one place where this settle. So for that, the soldiers come out of the barracks and play their role. But then there are some places which are more vulnerable and they have their own local immunity, the gastrointestinal tract and the respiratory tract because the gastrointestinal tract is exposed to a variety of germs which may enter with the food and the respiratory tract to the germs which may enter through the air. So there is a local immunity and uh, these areas also have what is called lymphoid tissue, which means that they have in their walls, the wall of the gastrointestinal stomach and intestines and the wall of the airways and so on. They have their own lymphoid tissue, which can be called sort of the barracks for the B and T cells. So in this lymphoid tissue, there are B cell areas and T cell areas and uh, uh, so we can say that in the gastrointestinal tract and the respiratory tract, there is a sort of a border security force because they are the, at the border between the outside environment and the inside. So what is going from outside, uh, it is not allowed to get in if it, is, if it can be harmful. So we have a border security force available right here. How about the spleen? The spleen can be considered a very big lymph node. It has B cell areas, T cell areas, but all the same, you might have heard that in some patients, the spleen is removed for certain reasons. And uh, even after losing the whole spleen, the person seems to function quite normally, which means that uh, if it is there, it must be serving a useful function as a sort of a reserve. But if it is not there, one can still live without it. So it, this can be considered sort of the central reserve police force, the CRPF, the body, the spleen. Now let's take the story further. Here is a germ. Uh, it has been seen by the lymphocyte, it, sorry, phagocyte. It can't, be, can't escape the phagocyte because they are present all over the body. But then the phagocyte realizes it can't take care of it. It has to be handed over to a better trained force, to a well-trained force. And therefore, what it does, it internalizes the germ, puts the ID of the germ on the surface, which will help the T helper cell take it to the right soldier. Now, what is the right soldier? Let's see. Now, here is the antigen presenting cell, which has the antigens of the germ, uh, which are significant for the process, which you may call sort of the IDs of the germ on the surface. And this T helper cell, by looking at this, has brought it to the right place. Now you can see that here, there's a variety of lymphocytes. There's a variety of lymphocytes and they have on their surface, uh, again, some markers by which one can identify that they are all different one from the other. And uh, 
the antigen presenting cell is uh, brought to the right place and uh, the T helper cell is uh, has brought to the right place. How do you know which is the right place? On the surface, you can see that there is something which is complementary to this. So just to sort of facilitate understanding, uh, the diagrammatic function, this is triangular and here is a hollow which is also triangular. So this can fit into this. And therefore, this is the soldier uh, which will be useful. But then it is more than a soldier, it is like a factory. This is just giving an indication of the type of uh, arms and ammunition that it can make. And uh, the type of arms and ammunition that will be manufactured in this cell will be specific for this germ. Now, this might look a little different from what you might have imagined. You might have thought that, uh, well, the uh, once the antigen is presenting to these lymphocytes, they will study the lymph germ and then come up with a solution. Now, this is the most amazing part of the immune system. The lymphocytes don't have to do any such thing because it seems that uh, there is a specific lymphocyte for just about every type of antigen that can be presented by the antigen presenting cell. As if they already know in advance what are the types of antigens that are likely to come and there is uh, a factory, the rudiments of a factory for which can manufacture arms and ammunition for this specific antigen already present in the body. Now this is amazing how nature anticipated what all germs are likely to attack a human being, have, a lymphos have lymphocytes which are specific for each of them, not only for the germs which have existed earlier, but even for new germs which may evolve in future. Coronavirus is a new germ, still our body had lymphocytes which could deal with it. And in contrast, what do the scientists do? They take one year to study this antigen, then come up with a vaccine. The vaccine works against the germs which have this particular antigen. The virus undergoes a mutation. Now it has, doesn't have this one, it has some other type of antigen. Now you're not sure whether this vaccine will work. Now here, you have a situation where you don't, the lymphocytes don't have to study what type of a, an antigen it is. At least a small population of lymphocytes which are specific for this particular antigen already exist in the body. So millions of germs, some which have already evolved, some yet to evolve, and we have a way of dealing with each one of them already installed in the body. An arms and ammunition factory installed in the body for each one of them. This is one of the most amazing things. And once again, nature came to our rescue. A virus like the Omicron, which had a large variety of antigens on its surface, acted like a sort of vaccine, because once it went in, then all these cells were, a variety of cells were activated because it had a variety of antigens and it made us immune to a very wide variety of forms which the coronavirus might evolve into. So that is how it worked like a natural vaccine, which, could, which was not for just one antigen, the way the man-made vaccines were. This was for a variety of antigens because it had a variety of antigens on the surface. So the right a place has been selected. So if we call this the ID of the germ, we can say that this thing on the surface of the lymphocyte is the signboard of the factory. The signboard says, this is the type of arms and ammunition I make. So the ID and the signboard on the factory are matched with each other and the right type of factory is selected. Now, once the right type of factory has been selected, then there's a small population of these. We need much larger number now because we have to deal with the germ, which is actually there. These factories are only for a potential infection, which might happen. Now the germ is actually there. So we need much larger number. So it is activated. There are mechanisms for activating this factory and the activation is, it's, you can say through multiple division, proliferation, their population increases. So it multiplies its tribe. Now you have a large number of these cells produced by the division of this selected lymphocyte. We may call them the effector cells because they are the ones which will give us an effect 
which will uh, which will lead to the effect which will help us fight the infection but along with this one wise thing that this mechanism does produces also a few memory cells so that uh, if uh, the infection happens a second time it is because of the memory cells that we would remember uh, oh i have seen this earlier now i know what to do and then the response will be much better that is important because these effector cells will do their job and uh, after all, soldiers have a limited lifespan. You can't be sure whether they'll come back alive. So they'll do their job, uh, sacrifice their own lives. Uh, their population will go down. But uh, the entire experience of having gone through the infection once will help because these memory cells have been left behind so that the second time there's an infection of the same type, exactly the same or closely related to it, then the body knows what to do because it has experienced it earlier, these memory cells do that job. Now the effector cells uh, may be considered to be of two types. So far the process was similar for all specific acquired immunity, but the effector cells can be of two types. And depending on that, we say that, say that specific acquired immunity can be of two types, cell-mediated or humoral. Cell-mediated immunity is mediated by sensitized T lymphocytes, which means that now these lymphocytes, T cells have been sensitized to work against the same type of infection. Broadly speaking, we can say that cell-mediated immunity is required when the germ resides within the cell, whereas humoral immunity is required when the germ is circulating in the blood. So if the germ is within the cell, one of the ways one might think is to deal with it to kill the germ within the cell. But uh, in cell-mediated immunity, that is not what always happens. One of the mechanisms used is uh, by the sensitized killer cells. Killer cell you know, is one of the types of T lymphocytes. When it is sensitized to a particular antigen, what this killer cell does is to kill the cell in which the germ is residing. So the germ has entered the cell. It has taken shelter in the cell itself feeling that it will be safe there, but cell-mediated immunity takes care of it by killing the cell. It's a rather radical cure, like, you know, if the person has the headache job uh, beheading the person, but all the same, in this situation, it is uh, 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 the best thing to do. Better to get rid of a few cells which have these germs than to uh, let the germ proliferate and affect more and more cells, enter more and more cells of the body. The second type of mechanism that cell-mediated immunity uses is to produce cytokines. Now, cytokines are chemicals which again help in fighting this infection, infection which is because of germs which have entered the cell and viruses do enter the cell and therefore in case of infections like coronavirus, it helps because uh, the viruses enter the cells because by themselves, they do not have a whole mechanism for survival. They use our DNA uh, or RNA to uh, our protein manufacturing machinery in the cell to survive. So, uh, therefore, they are within the cell. And uh, one of the ways you might have heard they were being dealt with was through producing cytokines. That's why, you know, sometimes when this uh, something went wrong with this mechanism, the wisdom gone awry, there was a cytokine storm. Now, what do these cytokines do when they are working properly? What these cytokines do is to attract other white cells of the blood, which can take care of the infection. They help in multiplying the, their own tribe so that we have more sensitized T cells of the same type available to take care of the situation. They reduce the multiplication of the germ within the cells and they increase the resistance of the person's cells to this germ so that it will, these germs will not be able to enter more cells because now these other surviving cells into which the germs have not yet entered are more resistant to the entry of the cell. So these are some of the things that uh, and these cytokines can do. So there are two types of mechanisms that cell-mediated immunity uses, predominantly for infections by germs which enter the cells. One is killing the cell into which the germ has entered. That is what the killer type of T cells do. And uh, the second mechanism is to produce cytokines that produce chemicals which will act at multiple levels, attract more white cells, multiply their own tribe, uh, increase the resistance of the host, 
reduce the multiplication of the germ. In other words, all these chemicals put together make the life of the germ miserable, make it miserable, and therefore it can be eliminated. So this is how cell-mediated immunity works. The humoral immunity works by production of antibodies. And this is what we shall concentrate more on in the next few minutes. So humoral immunity expressed by B cells by production of antibodies. In fact, B cells get transformed into uh, plasma cells. Uh, the detail is not absolutely relevant, but at the same time, uh, no harm knowing it, that these B cells undergo a little transformation into plasma cells, and it is the plasma cells that manufacture the antibodies. Now, how does an antibody work? Now, this diagram is extremely diagrammatic. All the diagrams so far were diagrammatic, but this in this one, uh, it is uh, all imagination just to facilitate understanding. Now, this Y-shaped structure is the antibody. This has a rough resemblance to the type of uh, structure that these antibody molecules actually have. And you can see that uh, this antibody has three places which can bind something. One is which can bind to the a protein which has given rise to this antibody. Spike and this antibody has the corresponding hollow. So it is like uh, a lock and key arrangement. The lock came with the food and uh, the right factory which could manufacture the keys for that lock was selected from the lymphocytes and it has given rise to these uh, antibodies which are its arms and ammunition which can work as keys for this particular lock. But then it has two other binding sites. One is uh, for uh, the complement. Complement you know, is a, a, a series of, uh, actually it's not a single protein, it's the result of uh, a series of, or a chain of chemical reactions uh, involving a large number of proteins collectively, which may be called the complement. But uh, the second site is for the complement. So, because you can see it completes complement because it completes the action of the antibody. Without the complement, this part alone will not be enough. This specific key will not be enough by itself unless the complement, which can complete its function, will be there. And then, you know, it has to be taken close to a cell which can eat the germ, and that is the phagocyte. So, it, the third site is for binding to the phagocyte. So, the Similarly, here is that we may compare the antibody to a dining table. And uh, here is the chair at which the diner can sit. So this third uh, binding site, which is for the phagocyte, may be considered a chair. The diner is there. It's a fussy guest. Uh, it wants not only the food, but also some sauce to go with it. Unless it becomes palatable, it will not eat it. So now the Antibody has arranged for the food, it has arranged for the sauce, and it is presented to the diner. And now it can eat the germ. Okay. So this is one way in which the antibodies work against germs. If there is a chemical, then of course, uh, so much complication is not needed. The antibody itself can neutralize the chemical. But uh, uh, by and large, this is the way antibodies work. Uh, with the help of the complement, it is uh, the phagocyte which in, so the primitive phagocytic mechanism, which was there even in the amoeba we saw, continues to play a role even in this relatively advanced, newly evolved form of immunity, that is the humoral immunity. So this is how antibodies work. They hand over the germ to the phagocyte. But then don't forget the memory cell because uh, all this response is very good. It helps us fight the infection with uh, uh, no symptoms or minimal symptoms. Uh, so say point one, uh, this one indicates the first exposure to the infection. Uh, within about uh, three weeks, the antibody levels have reached their peak. The infection has been taken care of. The person actually experienced symptoms or did not experience symptoms at all. Uh, but uh, uh, now, and the infection has been tackled uh, by now. If it's a flu-like 
uh, virus, then within a week, the person is all right. But the response is continuing maybe for a few days even after that. But then the antibody levels start coming down. And if the person is exposed a second time, you find that the response is much faster and much better. So it's uh, both quick and steep. And therefore, uh, the person is unlikely to, to experience any symptoms. The first time the person might have experienced symptoms, the second time unlikely to experience symptoms because of this extremely brisk and sharp and steep response. Now, this is something important to understand, uh, which uh, was being ignored when the uh, media were talking everything about antibodies. We found people who were positive, but they didn't have antibodies. We found people who had an infection, but when they didn't have antibodies, we found people who had been vaccinated, but a few months later, they didn't have antibodies and therefore they had to be given, they should be given a booster and so on and so forth and so on. Now, just imagine if the antibodies were to remain at the high level for every infection, even after the infection has been tackled, the thousands are thousands of germs against which our body produces antibodies, the blood will be full of antibodies. It is therefore desirable that these antibody levels go down and there are memory cells which will come into play if and when we get infected a second time. You don't have to be in a state of readiness all the time for all the germs. The soldiers don't have to be in fighting action all the time. You have to, uh, they have to go back to the barracks. The arms and ammunition has to be dumped somewhere. So if these antibodies are the arms and ammunition, it is being dumped somewhere. That's why the levels are going down. But we are ready when the second the germs comes a second time. So when uh, you find that uh, even amongst those who are uh, found positive, and of course, everybody cannot be tested, no matter how much testing you do in a pandemic like the coronavirus pandemic, everybody can't be tested. But even amongst those you test, you'll find a variety of people. Some people uh, are positive, but they have no antibodies. They have no antibodies because they were extremely healthy, perhaps, and uh, they did not that germ did not cross the respiratory tract. They were dealt with by the border security force. So if their nose and airways could take care of the germ, it never ended up activating the specific immune system, which will give rise to antibodies. It was taken care of locally. Some of them got mild symptoms like running nose. Some did not get even that uh, and re remained blissfully unaware of the fact that they got an infection unless they got tested and tested positive. These were probably the largest number. And uh, that's how we survived. And of course, there were many who got sick, many who died, but all the same, look at the percentage who survived. That happened because this was happening. But then in some cases, the virus did get past the airways and the person did fall sick, produced antibodies or produced antibodies, but the antibody levels went down. So the person was prone to a second infection, but the second infection was much milder or the second time the person didn't even come to know that I got infected. Now, this also is a proper time to discuss the principle of vaccination. The principle of vaccination, broadly speaking, is that you do not have to wait for the person to get the infection the first time to evoke this response. In the case of germs, it is possible to separate the antigenic component of the germ from the pathogenic component. Antigenic, which gives rise to this antibody response, and pathogenic, which gives rise to disease. So in some way, if you are able to separate the two, so that you let the antigenic component enter the body, but not the pathogenic component, then the person will acquire the immunity that is develop antibodies, but not the disease. So you're basically separating these two aspects of the germ. One, its capacity to give rise to uh, antibody response, and the second is its capacity to produce disease. So you can separate the two, split the two, you give the component as a vaccine, the component which can give rise to the antibody response, then the person does not fall sick because you have in some way neutralized the pathogenic component. So the pathogenic component is not active in the vaccine, and the result is that uh, the person has produced these antibodies. And therefore, when the person actually gets that infection, Although for the person, it is the first time that the person is actually getting an infection, the body treats it as if the infection is coming for the second time. The, first, in, the vaccine itself acted as the first exposure to the germ. The real infection, even when it is the first infection, is treated by the body as the second infection. And therefore, the response is more brisk. 
So that is how the vaccine works. Vaccines in general work. Now, how do we split the antigenic from the pathogenic component? There are a variety of methods that have been used. One of them is the killed vaccine. If you kill the germ, the germ cannot uh, produce disease because it has been killed, but uh, you kill in such a way that uh, the antigenic component is not damaged, it doesn't disintegrate, and this will work as a vaccine. The second type of uh, vaccine is the attenuated vaccine. That is the vaccine in which the germ has been attenuated. Attenuated means made mild, so that it has been made so mild that it will not produce the disease, but uh, it will uh, still be useful so far as antigenic component is concerned. So the antigen co antigenic component is intact, but uh, the capacity to cause disease has been made extremely mild so that the, it is unlikely to produce any disease. So attenuated, it has been tempered down. Now, again, this behind this, how this principle was discovered, there's a little story. Uh, there was a group of scientists working on uh, the chicken cholera germ and uh, therefore they were to study it they were growing it in uh, culture plates which means you know uh, under artificial conditions you have a plate in which you uh, provide all the nourishment that these germs may need and let them grow so that you can you have them available in large numbers and then you can try those things which may be able to uh, reduce their multiplication or kill these germs now to uh, use these culture plates, uh, you know, you pick up the germ from the culture plate and put it, uh, sort of introduce into the, say, chicken. The chicken gets cholera. So that is how one can study these germs. Uh, these germs, chicken cholera germs, had the capacity to produce cholera in chickens. Now, once uh, leaving behind some such culture plates, the staff went away on a vacation. And when they came back after the vacation, they found that uh, when they were transferring the germs from these culture plates to the chickens, the chickens did not get cholera. And on the other hand, if they produced a fresh culture, that did produce cholera in the chickens. So what is the difference between the two? The difference was that uh, in the culture plate, which had been left behind during the vacation, the germs had undergone repeated multiplication. And uh, the new generation of germs that had been produced through this repeated multiplication uh, had lost the capacity to cause disease. And at the same time, the antigenic component had been retained, uh, but uh, they had lost the capacity to produce disease. You may sort of think of it like this, that uh, if uh, there's a wild animal which hunts in the forest and is dependent on that food, if you put that animal in a zoo, the animal doesn't have to hunt anymore. If you provide it ready-made food in a plate every day, the way lions and tigers are fed in a zoo, this lion or tiger forgets how to hunt. So in a way, it loses its capacity to hunt. It is attenuated. Or say even in human beings, so somebody has the luxury of uh, getting everything without uh, doing any work, the person forgets to work. So these germs, for them to produce disease is like hunting, like doing some hard work to be able to survive. In the culture plate, all the nourishment was available. And when that was available generation after generation, eventually a generation came which forgot how to do that work. So it was no longer able to produce the disease, although it was still alive. So this was the, how the principle of attenuated vaccines was discovered. So once in a while, it's nice to go on a vacation. It may lead to a discovery. Yeah? Then the related germ vaccines. Uh, a germ against which a response is evoked, sometimes that same response in the body works also against a related germ. And the classical example here is that of cowpox. Cowpox affects only cows, but uh, if we introduce this cowpox germ, it will not cause disease in the human beings but it will give rise to a response which will work against smallpox. So a related germ vaccine. Then toxoid. Toxoid, you know, is a, a modified toxin. Toxin is a chemical produced by the germ which produces the disease. It can be modified 
so that uh, it will no longer be toxic, but it still retains the capacity to evoke an immune response. And the classical example here is that of tetanus toxoid. And uh, so, uh, some of you would have received a tetanus toxoid injection after an injury because uh, injury from a dirty surface can lead to tetanus, which is a very dreaded disease. It can lead to death. And therefore, as a routine, after any injury uh, in which the surface might be dirty, uh, toxoid vaccine injection is given. And uh, since one doesn't know when one might get an injury, uh, uh, but and luckily the toxoid injection uh, works for about five years. In fact, it's recommended as a routine. Uh, a person should keep getting a, a tetanus toxoid injection once in five years. Uh, most people don't do it, neglect it. I also neglect it, but all the same, that is sort of the ideal teaching that uh, this is something which we should keep taking throughout life every five years. Just one tetanus toxin. One doesn't know when one will get an injury and whether one will be able to get a, a place where you can get tetanus toxoid within a reasonable time. Not only that, if the person has been given this every five years, the because of the memory that will be retained in the body, the response will be very good even before the person gets the toxoid injection. Then the purified antigen vaccine. Why not just isolate that component of the germ which gives antibody response and give that? That would cause minimum complications because uh, whatever side effects may be there because of the other components of the vaccine will not be there because it's a purified ant antigen. These are the vaccines of the future. But all the same, the vaccines have been around for a relatively short period of time. Uh, we have survived for millions of years without these vaccines, and animals continue to do even now. Nobody goes and vaccinates animals by and large, unless it's a pet animal. Uh, by and large, animals don't get vaccinated, and still they continue they survive. Uh, so what has helped us is our own immune system. And in the absence of the system, no amount of antibiotics and no amount of vaccines can help us. The person has a premature death if the person has immunodeficiency. So therefore, uh, the immune system may be called our silent super personal protection equipment. We have it inbuilt in us, installed in each one of us. It works silently, like all the uh, really important work is done silently. Even the creation of this universe by the divine was not announced uh, uh, on the internet. It, there was no band baja band <laughs> announcing it. It was without any noise, silently it happened. And uh, the new creation which Shorabindu and the mother have talked about, which will have a significantly higher level of consciousness, for that also the beginning has been made, but then we don't seem to acknowledge it because that also happened silently. So all great things happen quite silently and that is how this immune system also works. Uh, so much so that we sometimes even forget it. We forget it because it works silently and uh, all the same, this is what has made us survive, coexist with the germs, uh, which may cause us disease and death. In spite of that, we have been able to survive, animals have been able to survive for millions of years because of this inbuilt super personal protection equipment. However, our immune system is not a fixed entity. It is subject to modulation. And this is again something which doctors also often forget because of the great detail that is known about the immune system. As I said that I know very little and what a top immunologist would know is much more and what the world knows is still greater and what remains to be known is also even more than that. So, but even what is known is enough to give us a great deal of complex details about the immune system. And when you learn about something in such detail, one assumes as if uh, the germ enters, then this is what happens, then this is what happens, then this is what happens. There's an antigen presenting cell and there is a selection of the right type of lymphocyte and then there is a cell mediated immunity, there's a acquired immunity. So when you understand the details of all this and the details are mind boggling now, uh, the person starts feeling as if this is an automatic mechanism which will happen in exactly the same way in each one of us once a germ enters the body. But that is not how it happens. It is subject to modulation. It can work 
to different with different degrees of efficiency in different people and this def efficiency can be modified now what is it that strengthens immunity the right type of diet taking the right type of food in the right amount in the right way and when we talk about the diet don't forget the spices spices are a concentrated source of antioxidants and antioxidants are uh, in general immuno boosting immuno enhancing and that is what uh, happened during the coronavirus. Suddenly, everybody became conscious of the positive effects of spices like uh, the black pepper, kali mirch, haldi, turmeric, ginger, adrak, uh, long pepper, pipali. We suddenly became conscious of all these and uh, realized their therapeutic effects. But then what was being used as a preventive and as treatment in, through these spices is also a part of our culinary practices. We use it routinely in the food and that is what gives us a good immunity. And that might have been one of the factors, this being a part of our routine culinary practices, might have been one of the factors why our immunity levels were perhaps good. And therefore, India did not suffer as much from the pandemic as some of the Western countries did. So a good, healthy diet, including a moderate amount of spices of the right type, is what gives us good immunity. Then regular, moderate physical activity. The yogic activity is better than others. We'll not go into the reasons why and the details of this. Then not putting into the body harmful substances like tobacco and alcohol, which can reduce the immunity, impair the immunity, and getting good quality sleep. Voluntary chronic sleep deprivation is emerging as a major cause of uh, illness and it also manifests as low immunity. So one not only gets lifestyle diseases like hypertension and heart disease because of inadequate sleep, infections also become more frequent. You might have seen that if a person does not get the right amount of sleep for a few days or weeks at a stretch, the person is likely to come down with a common cold which forces him to take a good nap, to wake up for that lost sleep. So adequate good quality sleep is also important. There is one more factor which is extremely important, perhaps which can override all these, and that's why I put it in the next slide, and that is peace of mind, faith, and hope. This can override many of the physical factors. And there are, uh, so to be at peace, to have faith in the healing mechanisms of the body, and therefore to have hope that I will get well, all this contributes to better immunity. Correspondingly, immunity is weakened by fear, depression, and lack of hope, the opposites of these. And uh, when immunity is deranged, it doesn't only lead to infection, it can lead to other things also. Immunodeficiency can lead to infections, it can also lead to cancer. It can lead to infections that is easy to understand because the germs can't be handled properly, it leads to cancer because cancer cells are also treated by the body as not belonging to the self. They're not like the normal body cells. They are also eliminated by the immune system. And therefore, the very beginning of a tumor is generally something that we can never come to know about. Probably small little tumors are forming in each one of us from time to time, but the immune cells take care of them. So in relation to cancer particularly, we call it immunological surveillance. So the surveillance system, uh, which is uh, built into the immune system, helps us in preventing cancers cancers which do not manifest, we don't come to know about them. So immunodeficiency uh, is one thing which is the result of deranged or impaired or abnormal immunity. Second thing is that it can work over time for the wrong reasons. That is hypersensitivity. Instead of being sensitive to germs, it becomes sensitive to the pollen grains which are unavoidable in the environment or it becomes sensitive to a food and so on. So these allergies and uh, why food allergies are becoming more common and are more common in the West than in India, one of the hypotheses is that the West has developed a lifestyle which is extremely sanitized. And therefore, the immune system does not get an opportunity to work. We try to prevent all types of infections by using by going into excess of hygiene and also coming using a very large number of vaccines uh, so that uh, the person does not get a chance to develop the immune system. Then the immune system starts working over time uh, for the wrong reasons. And that may be one reason why allergies then become 
more common in such situations. Then autoimmunity. When something goes wrong with the immune system, it may start working against some part of the body itself. Uh, there may be antibodies against the pancreas, which uh, and may give rise to diabetes. There may be antibodies against the thyroid, which leads to impaired thyroid function. And there can be many other types of autoimmune diseases. This person, Norman Cousins, got an autoimmune disease, ankylosing spondylitis, uh, in the 1960s. And uh, being an intelligent, educated person, he started uh, uh, thinking about his disease because he was told that only one in 500 survive ankylosing spondylitis. And we don't have anything very specific to offer. That's what he was told by the doctors. Uh, and then he somehow connected it with the stress that he had gone through in the days and weeks before he came down with ankylosing spondylitis. So then he thought if, then he asked a question which doctors had forgotten to ask. They had forgotten to ask because of the advances that modern medicine experienced during the last, uh, uh, during say the uh, period of about 1900 to 1950. That was a period, you know, of spectacular developments in modern medicine. All the vaccines, antibiotics, and uh, uh, treatment of endocrine diseases like thyroid and pancreas, and treatment of neutral, nutritional deficiencies because of the discovery of vitamins. All that happened during that short period, with the result that life expectancy jumped steeply from about 30 to 40 years to about 70 years. So sometimes not knowing enough can be useful. So he asked that if stress could be in some way related to this disease that I've got, ankylosing spondylitis, will not happiness and relaxation help? And to cut a long story short, he started treating himself with laughter and vitamin C. And using just these two things, laughter and vitamin C, he became one out of those 500 who recover from the disease. And then he went on to write this book, Anatomy of an Illness. And uh, this attracted the attention of many medical scientists. And uh, in countries, you know, where the rules are not very rigid, although he was not a doctor or a medical scientist, he was uh, invited by the University of California at Los Angeles Medical School to join on their faculty. And uh, in that position, what he did was, uh, one was to increase the awareness of the mind-body relationship among the doctors in that, and the medical students in that medical school. Another thing that he did was start giving ideas for research projects, started writing research grants, and soon UCLA School of Medicine had more funds that it could use for studying the mind-body relationship. And uh, when that happened, then it started offering funds to others. So in a way, UCLA became a funding agency for the rest of the United States for supporting research on the mind-body relationship. So there was a great acceleration of this research sometime in the 1970s and 80s and went on for at least 20, 25 years. And the result was by the year of, of around 2000, uh, a whole new branch of science had developed, which we now call psychoneuroimmunology. Psycho, the mind, working through the nervous system to affect the immune system. So the mental peace strengthens immunity and things like fear, anxiety, depression, and uh, sorrow they depress the immune system. That relationship is, has, was studied in this. And that, in a way, also became a sort of a bridge between the subjective and the objective. Psychological states are subjective. But the effects observed in the form of antibody levels and the killer cell population and so on, those are objective in nature. They give us numerical data, which can be analyzed, which convinces convince scientists that something is really important, significant is going on. And that's how this, this, that was the importance of this discipline. So he's considered now the father of psychoneuroimmunology. And uh, he survived this illness, which only one and a five hundred generally did. And uh, also ended up helping the rest of the world once again recognize the mind-body relation. Once again, because it was a rediscovery. Uh, ancient uh, systems of medicine like Ayurveda knew it. Uh, the Pioneers in modern medicine like Hippocrates also knew it. But then, as I said, it was forgotten the, in the early 20th century because of uh, the getting overshadowed, getting eclipsed by the advances in the physical aspects of medicine. 
uh, but then this rediscovery came in the second half of the 20th century. Spiritual masters never forgot it, although doctors did. And uh, here's a quote from the mother, establish a greater peace and quietness in your body that will give you the strength to resist attacks of illness. We can look at it like this, that uh, the agent or the germ is an essential component in the disease process. But while it is essential and necessary to produce a specific disease, it is not sufficient. It also depends upon how much resistance the host offers to the disease, how well equipped we are with our inbuilt mechanisms for resisting illness, for staying healthy. Not only that, the environment also matters. That is the surroundings in which we live. We may compare the agent or the germ to a seed. The seed will not grow unless the soil is good. So the host is the soil. But then the environment is also important. The, uh, after uh, putting it in the right type of soil, we should also have the right temperature and the right amount of rainfall at the right time, without which again the seed will not grow. So in the same way, the germ also uh, can give rise to a disease only if the host is, doesn't have poor, in, poor uh, resistance and the environment is also conducive to the growth of the germ. Uh, so all these three interact to give rise to the disease. So it's not just the seed which is important, the soil and the surroundings are also important. Now let's see how it can be applied to the COVID-19, which is still fresh in our memory. Here the agent was the coronavirus, the host was the human being. And human beings had varying degrees of resistance. And one of the things that could influence our resistance is uh, our mental state. And uh, uh, this is a very uh, telling sort of a, the computer battery, I think, needed a recharge as it's twisted on. So if we get a warning, like the way the germs give us a warning, warning the screen became a little less bright. Then you why. So COVID-19, uh, here's a report which appeared on the 24th of April, 2021 from Hyderabad. The pandemic has had a devastating effect on people tested positive to the extent that many are collapsing and dying of fear. So people are so afraid that if I'm corona positive, that itself is enough to kill me. Well, what it means is that I have germs picked up from my respiratory tract which you saw could be tackled so well in the respiratory tract itself if it crosses that border security force by the antibody producing mechanisms. So chances are most of these people would have got no disease at all or emerged with only mild symptoms, overcome it with only mild symptoms. And instead what happened was because of the fear, they died. Now what are the, uh, the agent is coronavirus, most of the human beings whose immunity uh, depended a lot on the psychological state. How about the environment? Pollution. Again, it was pointed out that places which have a high level of environmental pollution are likely to have suffer from the pandemic more. But is the pollution only because of the chemicals in the environment? Is it only because of the uh, particles uh, in the environment? Uh, here is uh, something which uh, comes from a psychiatrist, Dr. Alok Pandey. Powerful collective suggestions emanating from our current notions that seep in subconsciously. When to this collective atmosphere we find added the pronouncement of doom from a grave-faced scientifically trained doctor, then its power to damage and diminish the healing capacity becomes enormous. Now, during the coronavirus pandemic, these collective suggestions emanating from our notions were seeping in as a result of the media bliss, uh, telling, giving us all the figures of people who got corona, who were dying, and so on and so forth. And uh, therefore, the collective atmosphere was such that it led to fear and depression. The anxiety, I might get it. My near and dear ones might get it. If a person is positive, I might die, and so on and so forth. And these, this fear was being accentuated further very often by the scientifically trained doctors supporting this fear 
and uh, quite often saying as if the only way out was to take a vaccine. And uh, all this put together, the atmosphere that was built up of fear and anxiety and panic, it has an enormous effect on diminishing the healing capacity. Capacity to fight disease, capacity to heal. Because of the depressed immune system. Uh, Dr. Alok Pandey has written a beautiful book on the subject, Veda of the Body, where he points out these three important things which are important for withstanding disease, resisting illness, faith. Faith in the capacity of the body to heal, self in our own self-healing mechanisms of which the immune system is an important part. And we know how to strengthen that. And then we strengthen it and same time have faith in it. Receptivity, receptivity to higher force. Because after all, who has created this immune system? This amazing immune system that we talked about where there is a small population of uh, soldiers or ammunition factories already present for every germ that the world has seen in the past and the germs which may evolve in future. Who has put this together, that higher force? Do we let that higher force work in an uninhibited, uninhibited manner in the body? The fear, anxiety, and the lack of faith does not even let that higher force work properly in the body. So if we take away all those doubts and fears and suspicions and mistrust in this higher force and in the healing capacity of the body, which is a reflection of that higher force, we'll improve our receptivity to that higher force, which will become more open to that higher force. That higher force will get a better opportunity to work in our body. We have to let it work. That is what is meant by a better receptivity. And another closely related thing is the will. The will to live and the wish to die, both are very potent forces. So having the will to live, the will to recover, along with the faith and improvement in the receptivity is the best combination for staying healthy as well as recovering from disease quickly and completely. This is from a cardiologist. Not diet, not drugs, not exercise, not smoking, not surgery, not even genetics. No other factor has a more powerful effect on health and premature death and disease than love and intimacy. So the important thing is love and intimacy. Intimacy which develops from a sense of oneness, which inspires love, which in turn strengthens our immune system. So once again, we are back to that. Being good makes us more loving and caring. Being more loving and caring makes us happy. There's a, because love is expressed by giving and there's a joy of giving, mental peace that comes from giving and that in turn leads to better health and healing. Uh, I did recently a series of uh, five talks which are on our YouTube channel on the pioneers in mind-body medicine, which includes Norman Cousins, whom we talked about, who overcame his ankylosing spondylitis with a combination of love and with a combination of laughter and uh, vitamin C. And this cardiologist, Dean Ornish, who is one of the pioneers in using yoga in its most comprehensive sense for the treatment of heart disease. Apart from these two, also three other pioneers, Herbert Benson, Bernie Siegel, and Larry Dossey. And uh, you'll find these five relatively short sessions also on the YouTube. And uh, they'll tell you what they contributed, how they contributed, and what is it in their personal life that made them turn to this area of investigation and exploration. And out of these five, four are highly qualified doctors who went to some of the best medical schools in the world and were trained in modern scientific medicine and yet turned to this area and became the pioneers in establishing the mind-body relationship, which of course remains inadequate without the soul-mind-body continuum. And here's the last word from Sri Aurobindo. To feel love and oneness is to live. So to live a meaningful life, we should have a sense of oneness. This oneness will inspire love. And that in turn will be expressed by giving, giving what we have to those who need it, which in turn will give us peace and joy, which in turn will lead to good health. So that is the chain. Health becomes a byproduct. Fulfillment of the purpose of life also is a byproduct. 
some suggested reading in the same book, The Human Machine, which I've shown you a number of times. Uh, this topic is in chapter nine, The Body Defenses. This is a popular book for the general public. And uh, these are two textbooks, Fundamentals of Physiology, about 400 pages, Medical Physiology, about 1,000 pages. Uh, this is uh, a beautiful picture of the Shorabindu Ashram Delhi branch where I stay and work and you're all welcome here. For any questions or comments, you may ask after the session or uh, drop an email to yes at yesspirituality.com. Gratitude to the mother and Shorabindu for making these sessions possible and thank you all for being there. Thank you, Dr. Mizlani, for um, explaining it so beautifully. Um, I don't remember last when somebody had explained our um, human body so so beautifully, beautifully put. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any questions? Aditi, any questions in the chat? No, not yet. Not yet. Uh, I had a question. Um, you spoke about autoimmune condition. Um, so autoimmune conditions are uh, affect different parts of the body's um, uh, organs. So that, do all the cloudy cell that you call, are they all produced at the thymus or um, that attack different parts of the body or the different organs? in the body? Yes, one way of looking at autoimmune diseases would be that uh, they are the result of cells which have escaped the uh, mechanisms present in the thymus, which uh, prevent these cells from getting into the circulation. So either the thymus is weak or the thymus has been overwhelmed uh, because of derangement and immunity, which may be because of various factors, particularly mental stress, and of course, other physical lifestyle factors also make a contribution. But uh, the psychological factors seem to be the most important. And that may be one reason why the deficiency of thyroid is becoming extremely common. And for some strange reason, which may be genetic in nature, it's much more common in women than in men. So every other woman you talk to these days seems to have a thyroid deficiency. And that may be because of this collective sort of a effect of a poor lifestyle in terms of physical factors as well as stress levels. Thank you. Uh, there is one question in the uh, chat box. Can I just read it? Yeah. Among kids age 5 to 12 years, should we practice natural Ayurvedic ways only to improve immune system? Or is it advised to practice synthetically by giving them booster doses every half a year yearly? Uh, once again, we are back to that same uh, question, either or approach. We have to use uh, our judgment, uh, the knowledge available, instead of being uh, biased positively or negatively for, uh, for or against one system or the other. The fact is that uh, diphtheria was a dreaded disease. Uh, tetanus has been dreaded for uh, injury leading to death because of tetanus. Smallpox was a dreaded disease. The fact is that vaccines have helped wipe out these diseases more or less completely. Uh, no child now uh, dies of uh, diphtheria if they're properly vaccinated. So there is a vaccination schedule uh, that most countries have, including India. Uh, they represent some sort of a balance between uh, uh, the vaccines which are most effective vaccines which may not be so important and let the child acquire the infection naturally and what the country can afford. So all these things to put together give, uh, give us these vaccination schedule which are officially sort of sponsored by the governments. And then on top of that, one can use one's own judgment and if one thinks uh, sort of uh, competent to do so, to decide. So one can't say that it, after such and such age, it is one thing or the other. 
All right. The next question is, so we can heal most maladies naturally. Even thyroid conditions can be reversed. That's the question. Again, you see the, uh, again, I mean, there are limitations uh, of the physical. So, uh, when we say most conditions, yes, most conditions are amenable to self-healing. But sometimes the effort that they need and the concentration that they need, that is not within the capacity of each one of us. Uh, secondly, uh, the there are limitations of uh, uh, the physical in itself. So both these things are there. And, there, and sometimes the treatment is so harmless and so uh, rational that one feels that, well, uh, I can try the other approaches to be generally healthy because that would help anyone. A person who has a thyroid deficiency uh, does, doesn't have only a thyroid deficiency. The person uh, might have a few other minor illnesses and the person might develop some illnesses in the future. So why not do something which will uh, make me generally healthy? So treat this thyroid deficiency as an excuse for becoming healthier in general. This is a wake-up call. But then so far as thyroid deficiency itself is concerned, the uh, treatment is, uh, the, uh, thyroid is not making enough thyroxine, but we can give thyroxine from outside. Now, that is such a replacement therapy. You are trying to duplicate what the body naturally does. And uh, therefore, uh, it's not to be taken in the spirit of a drug. It can be taken in the spirit of a replacement of something which the body should be manufacturing, but for some reasons is unable to do so. So there's no harm in taking that. And once again, when people are told that now this has to be lifelong, but then it's lifelong because the thyroid does secrete thyroxine lifelong. And if it has stopped secreting, there is no sure shot way of making sure that to kickstart it once again so that it start manufacturing enough. Enough to be able to fight even the antibodies which are working against it. Because that will require much more effort on the part of the thyroid if had to fight those antibodies. So then at least keep providing the body the right amount of thyroxine from outside and then use this as a wake-up call for becoming in general more healthy. Dr. The next question is, age-related symptoms and diseases and pains are they related to psychosomatic, like most of them getting knee surgery, etc.? Well, most diseases do have a psychological component that is generally accepted now. The second thing is that the effect of the disease on the person, again, has a psychological component. A person may have a variety of diseases easily demonstrable, but the person may not be miserable. And on the other hand, a person may be miserable without any demonstrable signs and symptoms. So every disease does have a psychological component. Uh, but then again, whether a person will need knee surgery, will not need knee surgery, as I said, I mean, there is a limitation of the physical because the physical offers maximum resistance to transformation. And therefore, if uh, the damage to the knees has gone uh, beyond a certain uh, point, it will not uh, respond to uh, just uh, mental peace. Uh, and if there is a solution available, uh, which will give the person a better quality of life for a few years. And there's no harm in taking that treatment. Because one thing which we keep forgetting also is that uh, uh, depending exclusively on uh, uh, natural healing also means uh, that the person should have been conscious of this approach since young age. The person should have the time and the uh, capacity and uh, available to pay that much attention to good health. And apart from that, also be able to handle all the ups and downs of life in such a way that they will not become a barrier to or an obstacle to the full expression of the uh, capacity of the body to stay healthy and to achieve self-healing. To some extent, modern medicine itself has made us forget that capacity that's something Sri Aurobindo has repeatedly said, because uh, that again becomes a part of the collective atmosphere. We feel that if I'm ill, I must go to a doctor and I must swallow a pill. So that has become a sort of part of the collective atmosphere. And uh, that is one also reason why our self-healing may not be as good, which means that uh, uh, we have to, of course, revive that faith, trust the capacity of the body to heal and uh, 
do our best so that that capacity can give us the best results. So there are no more questions in the chat box. So maybe we can uh, end today's session. And uh, our next class will be on uh, Monday on the topic cardiovascular system. So thank you everyone for joining and we end with a few moments of silence. Thank you. <laughs>